Thank you everybody for being here tonight for this very special History Revealed program. We're so very pleased to be able to bring you tonight's program with Julie L'Enfant. And I want to turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe of the East Side Freedom Library to say a few words. Thank you, Robin. Um, the East Side Freedom Library has been partnering with the Ramsey County Historical Society on this monthly History Revealed program. <clears throat> when the stars align correctly, uh, the Ramsey County Libraries, the Roseville Library, and our friend Judy Woodward uh, are also on board with us. It's a great way for people to, um, as we like to say, have a conversation that connects the past and the present. Um, and we're really looking forward to tonight's. Um, if you're not familiar with the Eastside Freedom Library, please visit our website eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Um, sign up uh, to receive our twice monthly electronic newsletter and join us for these kinds of conversations. We're so glad to be working with the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Ramsey County Libraries. Thanks. Thanks so much, Robin. Thank you, Peter. And I want to reiterate Peter's comments. We've been working with the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for uh, going on for nearly five years now, and it's been fantastic. We're so grateful for their support and honored to be part of their programming. Um, please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society, the Eastside Freedom Library, and all of our libraries. Today is Give MN Day. Um, so please check that out or check on our websites. We all rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining, including the Ramsey County Historical Society's quarterly magazine, Ramsey County History. And you can find out more about all of our benefits on our website, which is rchs.com. It's on the slide on your screen. And again, please check out the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library's websites. They both have great programs and appreciate all your support. I just want to remind everybody if you have it or let you know if you haven't already seen it on Tuesday, December 14th at 7 p.m. We have another very special history revealed program about another woman artist with Peter's cousin, Melissa Ratcliffe Burt on Jean Follett women artists and the St. Paul School of Art. This will be another online program. So again, see our website for more details and to register for Zoom. As a reminder, just wanna ask everybody to please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off during the program. You can type your questions in the chat and your comments and Peter and I will read those out for Julie to answer after the program. The program is being recorded and it will be up on our YouTube channels shortly, probably Friday, maybe Monday. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate their contributions, all the contributions of the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website, which includes actionable ways in which RCHS pledges to honor the Dakota and other indigenous peoples of Minnesota Mekoche. We are committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community, and we are so pleased to bring you tonight's program. And I want to thank our presenter tonight. Julie L'Enfant was a professor of his, art history at the College of Visual Arts in St. Paul and is the author of seven books, including The Gag Family, German Bohemian Arts in America, which was put out in 2002, Pioneer Modernists, Minnesota's First Generation of Women Artists, 2011. And both of these were winners of Minnesota Book Awards. So congratulations to Julie for that. And uh, another recent book that we've had a program about was Nicholas R. Brewer, His Art and Family, which came out in 2018. 
And I'm so pleased to ask to see Julie back here again with this wonderful book on Hazel Belvo. It's a fantastic book, um, like all of her books, and I loved reading it. And if you'd like to purchase this title or other books of interest from our History Revealed series, please see our partner Subtext Books at subtextbooks.com. And I'll put a link in the chat um, for a direct link to tonight's title. So thank you, Julie. I'm going to turn it over to you right now. Thank you. Thank you and hello everyone. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, I'm here to talk about a new book on Hazel Belvo. Hazel is an artist and teacher who has exhibited widely for over 60 years with work in many museums and private collections. She is Professor Emeritus at the uh, uh, Minnesota College of Art and Design, and she's been a mainstay of the Grand Marais Art Colony for many years. Her work is prolific and various. It comprises drawings, paintings, prints. Her subject matter is very wide, landscapes, portraits, nature studies. Many of her works are in black and white, but many are also in gorgeous color. Her work is visually appealing and it's full of meaning. She's traveled extensively in order to paint. For example, for many years, she and her partner of 35 years, Marcia Cushmore, also an artist, traveled to France and painted at the gardens of Giverny, the home of Impressionist painter Claude Monet in Normandy. Her most recent exhibition is with Marsha, Two Artists, Two Stories, Juxtaposition During COVID, A Conversation. And because during the COVID lockdown, they couldn't travel, of course. And so what they did was a series of still lifes at home. Um, each did her own version of a still life in vases that the two artists own. We really could explore many avenues in Hazel's long career, but she's best known for her hundreds of images of the legendary little spirit tree. And that's what we'll explore tonight. This famous tree is at Grand Portage Reservation on the North Shore of Lake Superior. It's very old. It's been documented for over 400 years. It's sacred to the Ojibwe. It's believed to have spiritual powers. And in the past, natives and voyageurs brought gifts to the tree, tobacco, vermilion. They were seeking healing or protection during trips across Lake Superior. And even today, people bring gifts to the spirit tree. Dewey Albinson is cited as the first white artist to paint the tree. He named it the witch tree because he heard old stories that an evil spirit lived there. And he was told that it could only be approached in groups bearing gifts to appease it. And so the witch tree is a name that stuck in white culture until the 1990s when it was replaced by a more accurate translation of the Ojibwe name. So I'll refer to it as the witch tree in earlier years and then in more recent years uh, as the spirit tree. Albinson made a number of paintings and drawings of the tree and so have other artists because in many ways it's picturesque. It almost asks to be painted and photographed. But no artist has dealt with the tree as extensively as Hazel has. She said, I've studied it every day of the year 
in every season, at every time of day. For me, it is a personal symbol of survival. Furthermore, an important aspect of her practice has been to represent the tree in series. Now you're looking at a series she did between 2010 and 2014, 10 paintings. All are called spirit tree, but each has its own name, a specific name like Grandmother Nokomis, Survivor, Matriarch, Prophet, Sage, Guardian, Poet, Crone. They're all the same size. They're monumental, five and a half by four feet. They're as tall as a person. And as you can see, they're in very different colors. They're not realistic in the sense that she has painted the tree exactly like it looks with its natural colors, but it's very expressive. These images are very powerful. They're the culmination of a long evolution for Belbo. So I'll introduce you to her life. And then we're going to come back to this series of paintings. The book is based on 35 formal interviews and even more meaning, meetings. I, I got to know Hazel very well. And I also had access to family photographs and all manner of documents that Hazel has kept. Her life and work are remarkably intertwined. That's what I learned, that there is no separation between her art and okay. her life. She was born in 1934 in Southern Ohio. She lived with extended family on a farm or very near that farm in the small village of Centerville, which is now a suburb of Dayton. She drew obsessively from an early age, and she said she had an internal necessity to draw. Uh, and that's a phrase of Vasily Kandinsky, an artist from whom Hazel has learned a great deal. The roots of an artist's work, especially an expressionist like Hazel, is childhood. Franz Klein, the abstract expressionist, told Hazel, you never shake your original landscape. Her mother and grandmother were very talented, hard workers who encouraged her. Uh, she tells a story that uh, says a lot about her and about her later work. One time her mother and grandmother had repapered a dining room wall. They had worked on it a week. Hazel was so delighted with the wall that she took crayons and drew all over it. Her mother, when she saw how delighted Hazel was with the wall, didn't even reprimand her. He simply repapered the wall. That is the best kind of mother for an artist to have, Hazel said. It also forecasts the fact that she works big. She still likes to work big. One of her magical places in childhood was the pond in the next field over from the farmhouse. It was surrounded by trees with gnarled roots growing down in the water. She would go there by herself in times of trouble. She had a collection of little tin boxes where she hid her treasures and she would arrange them and then rearrange them. It was my ritual, she said, it was mystical. She loved the trees on the farm, a hackberry tree, a black walnut. They had an orchard with fruit trees planted in a grid. Hazel was a very good student, very active in everything, and she loved uh, certain subjects, particularly Latin and biology. She also loved music. She drew and painted constantly. After a year of college, she returned home and married Norman Belvo, a friend from childhood, and they had two sons, Joe and Danny. In time, though, her need to study and grow as an artist 
that internal necessity led her to leave the farm. At the Dayton Institute, where she furthered her learning of academic techniques and was trained in portraiture, there she also explored cubism, which strengthened her interest from biology in organic structure. The Institute was a traditional art school, but it was undergoing a lot of change. Instructors from New York had been brought in to teach abstract expressionism. This was the direction of the avant-garde in America. By 1959, it was the dominant force in American art. The instructor um, with whom she felt an instant rapport was George Morrison. Um, he had already established a big reputation as an artist in New York associated with the abstract expressionist circle. Artists such as Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, and Franz Klein. Abstract expressionism in general, if I can generalize, is large scale work, abstracted in form, concerned with deep feeling and ideas, done spontaneously with color and form arising from the unconscious. It's meant to be universal art, not personal. Good. Morrison said, you begin with the act of painting itself, then images begin to emerge. Eventually, Hazel married George Morrison, and it was he who first took her to see the spirit tree. He was born in Grand Portage of Ojibwe heritage. At the time, she was 25 and a new mother. She didn't go down to the tree that time because she had a new baby in her arms. That was Briand. Two years later, she went down the path, down the hill, over the rocks, and stood in the cove where the tree is. Surrounded by the forest and the walls of rock, this place felt like a cathedral to Hazel, and she has taken many people to see it in the following years, including me. And this photograph shows me with Marsha and Hazel and Briand, now an adult, uh, taking us down to see the tree. And here's the passage, the two rocks through which you pass to get down to the shore. It's very meaningful to Hazel that the tree grows out of the earth, but has roots in the water. I am like that too she has said. An astrological counselor told her one time that the perfect place for her is one foot on land, the other in water. Her sign is Sagittarius. She returned a couple of times in the 60s and she drew and painted the tree. These are still in her collection. Meanwhile, she and George had moved to New York. And this was the place to be, the only place to be for artists, serious artists at that time. And it was very exciting and stimulating. And um, I want to read a little bit from Hazel's piece called Coming of Age in the 60s. I learned fast and soaked up the art world. Greenwich Village, the East Village, the Cedar Bar, Dillon's Bar, the galleries, the Tuesday night openings, happenings, Alan Capro, Klaus Oldenburg, Jim Dine, Jazz, Birdland, Jerry Mulligan, Dealers, the Whitney Museum, MoMA, the Met, the New School, the curators, the artists, I found myself sitting in the Cedar Bar with George Morrison, John Weber, 
Alan D'Arcangelo. Here, Willem de Kooning and Joan Chamberlain at that famous bar. When Brion was born, his godfather was Franz Klein. So uh, George and Hazel were very much in the thick of things in New York in the 1960s. And they spent summers in Provincetown where she would go for summers many years with Joe, Danny, and Briand. Now, abstraction had dominated the art scene in the 50s, but it was beginning to give way to pop art, junk art, earthworks, a slew of new avant-garde movements. Hazel learned from all of it, but she went her own way, taking her own work back to the beginning. She was struggling to capture structure, not appearance. By then, art was a process of transformation for Hazel, not representation. Now she cites influence by her friend and mentor, Louise Nevelson, who is known for her box-like sculptures. Now here are uh, particular points of connection between Hazel and Louise Nevelson. Nevelson too had studied cubism and acquired a new sense of structure. Nevelson's work was a repository of personal secrets. It was very autobiographical. And she believed art came from the artist's childhood. And she helped reinforce Hazel's uh, understanding of that. Nevelson created large wall-sized environments. There were very few successful women artists in New York at that time, and it's tremendously affirming to Hazel to have such a female mentor as Louise Nevelson. John Chamberlain was also one of her good friends. He shared her interest in reading and in words. He liked wordplay. And his tribute to Hazel, the work that was uh, associated with her name, uh, is not meant to be representational, of course. <laughs> it was an unconsciously created assemblage, and he titled it Belvo Violet because he loved the sound and the look of her name, Belvo. Belvo Violet. Violet. He liked wordplay. And uh, he based his work on free association and the unconscious. He introduced her to his friend, Robert Creeley. Robert Creeley's poems meant a lot to Hazel, especially a form of women and the door, which are quoted in the book. And I'd like to mention that both Chamberlain and Creeley were associated with Black Mountain College which was an experimental college of the arts that fostered interdisciplinary learning and freedom in creation. Uh, it was really a crucible for many avant-garde artists in the 60s, uh, well, until its closing in 1957, that so many notable artists came through Black Mountain College and it seems to me that through her friendships in New York, Hazel absorbed many ideas from Black, Mar uh, Black Mountain. Uh, she had many stories about New York. One of my favorites is how she encountered Mark Rothko in the Museum of Modern Art one afternoon and ended up spending the whole afternoon with him. And she gives him credit for inspiring her to teach along with painting, which is something he did. She also was constantly drawing and painting, even when she could hardly afford painting materials. She read and also wrote a lot of poetry. 
She took classes at the New School for Social Research. Later, living in Providence, she uh, was a research fellow at the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College in nearby Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, her project was based on intense color studies guided by Joseph Albers' Interaction of Color, a publication which was new at the time. Now it's a standard text in art schools. Um, and I should mention Albers was a key figure at Black Mountain College. Now, Albers' homage to the square, and you're seeing a, a montage of those, presents the same composition and different color combinations to show that color isn't stable. It changes in relation to other colors. His uh, concept here is that properties of color are functions of the observer's eye rather than the object itself. Albers' exercises were designed to train the artist's eye. Now, Albert's studies were strictly impersonal, as you see. Hazel's, on the other hand, were often quite personal. For example, she gave her sons cardboard to paint on, and then she adapted interesting compositions. So this she titled From Joe. It uses the Albert's process of the same composition with different colors, but it's very personal. And she says, it's flame-like. Joe was like that, flame-like. And notice its size. Here is Hazel next to this uh, six by six foot painting. And uh, she, it was important to her that paintings be life-size and large-scale. Paintings confront the viewer and interact on a human scale. And for her, that interaction is the important thing. Among the many benefits of the Bunting Fellowship for Hazel was seminars with distinguished women, such as Barbara Tuchman, the historian, Denise Levertoff, the poet, Tilly Olson, a feminist and political writer, and Mary Bunting herself, a microbiologist and president of Radcliffe. In 1970, Hazel, George, and the family moved to Minneapolis when George began teaching at the University of Minnesota in the new Indian Studies Department. I should note that Hazel decorated this house and did much of the renovation herself. She's done that with a series of wonderful residences. A pivotal event in her life was the death of her son Joe from leukemia in 1972. During his final illness, Hazel obsessively made small, precise drawings as she sat by his bedside. They came from her unconscious. She was not thinking about herself, she said, but she was simply drawing as her unconscious guided her. The images proved to be about seeds, generation, the cycle of life. They were images of growth and regeneration in the face of death. They were a way of dealing with the reality of death and life. She has said, drawing is my way of understanding the world. And this is a, certainly a strong example. When they were first exhibited by the MIA, they were exhibited in a grid, which suggests the natural pattern of life, an unending cycle. For many years after Joe's death, Belvo was not able to use strong colors. And she produced a number of 
what she called white paintings that used colors so muted and faint that they're hard to photograph. Form can be discerned if the viewer stands close and looks attentively. And this is a process a bit like meditation. They're large scale. Some of those white paintings are 11 feet high. The surfaces are very beautiful. They're made up of countless delicate brush strokes. Some of the subjects are the structure of trees as seen through an electron microscope. Now, these images came from a book called The Biology of Plants, given to her by a friend, which she still has, and I was able to examine too. And it, uh, again, points up Hazel's need to see things from their very beginning, to go into depth and into structure. She did paintings and monoprints, uh, which she called Wolf Moon, based on the full moon on the darkest night of the year, the winter solstice. This is associated with her birthday, which is December 18th. Her interest here was not in the dramatic appearance of the moon, but in the uh, trees, the structure of the trees and plants dormant in the ground. Again, their cellular structure. Hazel had begun teaching at the Lincoln School in Providence, Rhode Island. The book goes into her teaching in some detail. Uh, uh, she started there in the first grade and worked all the way up through uh, middle school. She took students on seeing walks, as she called them, where her students had little windows they had made out of construction paper. And she taught them how to use those little windows to frame good pictures. Sometimes she took students under a gigantic copper beech tree that was in front of the Lincoln School. It made a natural kind of house and the students drew there. She wanted them to feel the thrill of nature. In 1972, Hazel began teaching at St. Paul Academy. And later, she earned a master's degree in design at the University of Minnesota. She wrote a thesis for that master's on how to teach a course called visual presentation. One of the visual components of her thesis was a set of 10 large drawings called Meditation on the Witch Tree, 60 by 40 inches, very large scale drawings. And so it's at this point that Hazel really began to work on the witch tree in earnest. Now, this is a big change from the white paintings. These 10 drawings were very tactile, sensual, very physical, and they came from a new place of power in the artist. Her thesis very specifically connected the tree to the human figure. This is something we have seen before in, I'm sorry, romantic painting. Look at this painting by Caspar David Friedrich, Two Men Contemplating the Moon, where the tree reflects, echoes, intensifies the feelings of the men. Early on, Bell, she was just drawing parts of the tree, especially the crown, the head, or the trunk, analogous to the human torso. The twist of the trunk is sometimes really exaggerated to intensify the dynamic power of the image. Now, the materials and the process really help convey the meaning. She used heavy rag paper with rough texture. The pencils ranged from light to dark, 
She also used tobacco juice and vermilion pencil. Remember, tobacco and vermilion were the traditional gifts for the spirit tree. Notice the strong marks and the contrasts. She said, your stroke bends the picture plane. It can be equated to carving out the shape. With the stroke, you shape the surface. Students should learn to think of building or carving with their strokes. So this represented a new direction for all of Belbo's work. Her visual work for the thesis was exhibited at the Warm Gallery in 1981. By this time, she was deeply involved with the feminist movement. WARM, the Women's Art Registry of Minnesota, now called the Women's Art Resources of Minnesota, was one of the first women's collectives in the United States, founded to support women artists and to give them opportunities to exhibit. In a sense, this gave women permission to make art out of their personal lives, something that had really been looked down upon by the abstract expressionist movement. Warm also helped shape her teaching, which was based on consciousness raising, drawing out what was inside students rather than demonstrating what they were supposed to do as her male teachers had done. It's not working easily, sorry. Her exhibition uh, was complicated, complex, I should say, and it comprised self-portraits and plant drawings, plus an expanded meditation on the witch tree. Uh, it included the 10 large-scale witch tree drawings, which you've seen some of, 19 photos of the approach to the tree, the setting, the path, the rock, the tree itself, and then 10 smaller drawings of the tree with written reflections by Belvo and eight other women. She made it very explicit that it was a spiritual journey to the tree, just like a pilgrimage. The, and here is a self-portrait, one of three, and it has the witch tree in the background. And here's an example of her biologically accurate plant drawings, which were based on life-size plants and are life-size. She would go on to make hundreds of images of the spirit tree, prints, drawings, and paintings. And here she is with George preparing um, to make a print for um, an ex exhibition at the St. Paul Academy. Uh, she based her print on a large scale drawing that took her 100 hours to make and it is life-sized leaves and the vegetation on the path to the tree. She made five plates in different color palettes and they were produced by Landmark Editions. Here is one uh, version and another version which was printed on black paper. In 1985, she exhibited 25 little paintings of the witch tree. And uh, she was thinking about art history. And these various paintings show different times of day, different seasons, the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water the signs of the zodiac. Here are a couple of examples 
Wolf Moon, Witch Tree, Vision Quest. Some were to her artist friends. Here is Aunt Tr Spirit Tree for Anna Mendieta, whom she had known in New York. And a tribute to her friend, Krista Walsh. This is actually based on a sketch Krista had made when visiting Lake Superior. Another important aspect of her study of the witch tree was this book, which came out in 1992, a collaboration with poet Joanne Hart. Hart wrote 34 poems. Hazel did linoleum relief block prints, and they were done independently of the poems, but in fact, they correspond very nicely. And they are combined with prose pieces that place the tree in its historical and cultural context. The relief prints are stark, black and white, as if to show the dramatic essence of nature. They measure seven by seven inches, and even in this small format, the tree looks monumental. Some are quite abstracted. This is the root of the spirit tree. They're like dreams showing the magic of the tree vortex. The book includes Meditation on the Witch Tree, which is Hazel's seven-part description of her body of work from her thesis. And she would use Meditation on the Witch Tree, but it would now be Meditation on the Spirit Tree, 50 new works in 1994 at the Johnson Heritage Post Art Gallery in Grand Marais. This included new tobacco juice drawings. Here are a couple of examples. And also some large scale paintings. The catalog for that show included the meditation on the witch tree, that seven part description that uh, originated in her thesis, but had also been used in the book of poetry. I'd like to read just three of those. Of course, it's printed in full in the book, but to give you an idea of how uh, good a writer Hazel is, how eloquent she is. These are the the last three parts, the torso. The body or stem of the spirit tree twists, voluptuous, old, curving up and out. This is a body to embrace, a body to respect, a body whose visual manifestation is her own deep memory, her experiences. She knows generations of wisdom. What has happened here? I see a body gestating, for the essential process of life is gestation. The top of the tree remains evergreen, even at 50 degrees below zero, darkening, showing rusty brown, yet always becoming bright with new growth spread toward the sun. The branches are antennae to the universe. Here is the exchange I marveled at when, as a child, I learned that plants breathe out what we animals breathe in, and we breathe out what plants breathe in. I marveled over this miracle. I still do. The tree, spirit. This wise one is our connection to the universe, the secret of survival. Here we remember life in harmony with all being, past, present, future. The reverence we feel is the full embodiment and practice of love. Until we have a global culture which understands and believes this, our entire planet and all its life is endangered. 
why did Hazel do the same subject over and over again? Artists have many reasons for working in series. Monet, for instance, and other impressionists to observe different times, different seasons. Cezanne did the same subject again and again to experiment with formal elements. Rembrandt did self-portraits over and over to observe and record change. Hazel suggested in her thesis that the content of her drawings was, like Rembrandt's self-portraits, a study of time, of aging, and of the life process. Hazel's own answer to this question in 1996 was this. Someone recently asked how I could spend 30 years drawing the same thing. I learned about obsession from my grandmother, who was a farmer and a quilter. I watched her every day work through her chores of feeding, gardening, hoeing, canning, cooking, washing and sewing to get to her quilting. Whatever she was doing, she always had at her hand the quilt block, about 12 inches square. But while she was piecing them, they took on various interesting shapes. It was then that the grand image emerged. Not only did growing up with these prominent geometric organic patterns inform my eyes, but I saw what work and obsession is. And what I took from this is that what it takes to make a good life is work, repetition, rhythm, and pattern. Hazel has also related the seven aspects of her meditation on the spirit tree to Hindu ideas about love and wholeness. The meditation is a metaphor for the body. The seven energy points of the tree are parallel to the seven Hindu chakra points. She relates individual energy to universal energy, individual harmony and healing to universal healing. This idea of universal energy emerged in 1996 in her drawings of the victory of Samothrace at the Louvre in Paris. It's at the top of a grand staircase, and with its base, it's 18 feet tall. On the flight home, Hazel was leafing through a sketchbook, and she thought for a moment that she was looking at a drawing of the spirit tree, and she became fascinated by their kinship. The victory was originally in a rock niche overlooking the Aegean Sea. It's always been seen as spiritual and uplifting, like the spirit tree. And because of the victory's history, it's damaged, and it was once broken into small pieces and restored, it's seen as a symbol of survival. And this brings us back to the eight spirit trees, the matriarch, the Grandmother Nicomas, etc. These are personages, archetypal female figures, personages. From the beginning, trees were personages to Hazel. She drew people from childhood and was trained as a portrait painter. And these paintings are like portraits, which are usually vertical, like a tree. Horizontal compositions are stable, whereas the vertical is upwardly mobile, and hence it's more spiritual and uplifting. For Hazel, it's optimistic. She is innately optimistic. Now, she is an expressionist. She alters and distorts color in order to convey emotional force. Her colors are bright, sometimes even harsh. The form is twisted, gnarled, dynamic. The brushwork is noticeable and really shows the hand of the painter. It gives a sense of her energy. 
and it gives life to the surface. It suggests living bark. And remember that these paintings are large scale, five and a half feet tall, hence they interact with the viewer on a human scale. The titles, Grandmother Nokomis, Matriarch, Sage, Crone, are associated with older women and their metaphors for life, growth, maturity, and wisdom. A tree, like a person, has to endure the seasons and the weather, especially on the North Shore, and time itself. These images give a sense of power, grandeur. We can survive and become wise no matter what we have to endure. The matriarch is Hazel's favorite, and that's why we chose it for the cover of the book. And she is a matriarch in several senses. She is a wise woman, a mothering figure who nurtures family, friends, and students. She has challenged patriarchal ideas about art and society all her life. Motherhood has been central to her life. Her sons were always interwoven with her work. And she cherishes connection. She is in a line of strong, hardworking women. Remember her grandmother and mother. And she considers her life with Marcia a creative partnership. Hazel's story, and I've just given a taste here, has a positive message. And one of my favorites is the way it overturns certain stereotypes of the artist. Um, the stereotype of the artist as a heroic individual, solitary and misunderstood, like Van Gogh or powerful and macho, irresponsible, maybe even cruel in his personal life, like Picasso. Hazel is responsible, engaged, and sane, and she believes in the sanctity of the earth and the role of women as creators and nurturers. At every stage of her life, she's faced challenges and losses, yet her work conveys resilience, vitality, and strength. It expresses her belief that art can create community and help heal the world. I hope this message can find an even wider audience through the book. It was published last year by Afton Press under the leadership of Ian Graham Leesk. The book was designed by Patricia Olson, a distinguished designer and professor emeritus of St. Kate's and Hazel's longtime friend and colleague from WARM. The book was really a labor of love for us all with the production very ably managed by Beth Williams. And I thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you, Julie. I just want to remind people to feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat. And we'll give people a minute or two. And Hazel, I see that you've turned your mic on. If you want to say hi to everybody, that would be great. Oh, hello, and thank you, Julie. I thought it was a wonderful to listen to your um, description of the book. Thank oh, thank you, Hazel. Um, Kyle has a question for Hazel. Hazel, what are you working on now? Oh, well, um, Marcia and I uh, have, just, have been working on um, a body of work called um, a COVID conversation, uh, juxtaposition, where I um, have worked um, with strict observation and then Marcia has taken my 
strict observation and the palette and deconstructed it into an abstraction. So there are two paintings that are uh, one a rectangle, one a square, that are the whole piece. That's what we're working on right now. The subject is, um, uh, they're like portraits uh, of um, hand-blown glass vases and flowers. So, and they're, verti they're vertical um, rectangles. Am I coming across okay? Oh yes, we can hear you just fine, thank you. Oh, yes, thank you, Kyle. Um, Kate was asking Julie and Hazel, which is your favorite spirit tree portrait? Mm. Oh. Well, um, it, it's hard to pick a f favorite one because they each are so meaningful to me. Um, but I, I, um, I chose the, the matriarch uh, to be the most uh, representation of the ideas because, uh, well, for one thing, black and red are the uh, archetypal matriarchal colors, uh, um, historically. And um, so uh, I, I like that very much. Julie, what is your favorite? It's hard for me to pick a favorite too, but I do love the tobacco juice drawings because of their, oh, complexity and intensity and the symbolism too. Uh -huh. Well, they're wonderful to do. I love that, that kind of drawing. Are there other questions? What we can do is turn off the recording and we'll do that in a minute. But first I wanna say thank you to Judy Woodward with the Roseville Library, Peter Ratcliffe at the Eastside Freedom Library, everybody at the Ramsey County Historical Society um, who helps us put these programs together with their support. And a big thank you to Julie and to Hazel for coming tonight and having such a great program. And it is a wonderful book. Um, it's a large book full of photos and images of of the artwork and um, I really enjoyed it. So again, check out subtext books for that. And, um, and thank you everybody for coming. Watch our websites for more programs and I'm gonna stop the recording. It will be on our Eastside Freedom Library channel as well as our Ramsey County Historical Society YouTube channel. So. Thank you.